Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to APRA's Remedial Wall and Brick Repair Systems webinar. Today, we've got two presenters well experienced in the industry. We've got Barry Cooper from Westox and Nader Zaki from uh, Helifix. With Barry, he's been around for quite some time, having uh, moved to Australia around the time of change from decimal uh, into decimal currency. So he's been here for a while. Um, Barry's the director of Westox and is a, who are a developer of remedial systems to restore heritage buildings um, in all sorts of material, wood lathe, ceilings and walls, desalination of masonry to prevent deterioration and eliminate rising damp. Barry's going to run through various types of damp proof courses used, but will also make the point that dampness is not the cause of damage, although it has received the blame for many years. He'll then go on to show how salt contamination from ground travels in solution into masonry uh, and causes the damage and how that underlying cause is removed and that it must be removed to have a successful treatment. Otherwise you're left with hygroscopic salts in the wall leading to secondary dampness and on goes the process. Nada will be presenting on remedial wall brick tires and strengthening systems. He got his Bachelor of Engineering degree from the Uni University of New South Wales. He's worked in both government and private sector as design engineer. Yeah. He's currently the business unit manager of Helifix Australia. Uh, Helifix have helical designed wall ties, um, proprietary system, uh, and have developed a range of high performance stainless steel ties, fixings and most repair and reinforcement systems. They're suitable for strengthening of clay, stone and concrete masonry structures and to address the underlying problems of rust and cavity ties, cracking of masonry, separation of connecting walls um, and also work on increasing flexural and shear strength. Plus the other things of brick growth, foundation movement and footing failures. So enough of my face on the screen. I think we'll probably hand over to Barry. Thank you. No, it ain't gonna work. <laughs> I do this. You're right. right, I'll start here. <clears throat> I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation and go through the different types of dam courses that have been tried. Um, obviously, uh, what I'm saying here is that the rising damp is not always the cause of the main damage. And it's, it's not not that well known, it's getting better. Uh, people are getting better educated now and they're understanding that salt is actually a huge contributor to damage caused by damp. The different methods, uh, I'm gonna go through some of the most effective ones. There are some I won't touch on because I don't believe in pre-measured amount, amounts of material being put in the wall, uh, especially if they're water-based, because if they don't work the first time, they're not going to work the second time because they repel themselves. The most common one used years ago was the napping tube, and just about everybody got on board making these, even uh, Corning, the uh, people who make all the cutlery, sorry, not the cutlery, the the dishwasher, the dishes and the plates and stuff. If you look here, these vents are in the wall and they actually cause the wall to dry. So actually controlling the damp rather than fixing it. And instead of getting that straight line, you get these nice circles. You can see as the salt accumulates around the vent, it slowly accumulates in the pores of the uh, absorbent material that these are made of. And then they block up and then the damp breaks down and then you're back to square one. You see these everywhere in Europe, uh, Italy especially. There are thousands of them in every heritage building. The CSIRO did a lot of testing on these and they found that uh, they actually caused more damage than they fixed. And drilling a hole in the wall did exactly the same, uh, had the same efficacy as putting the vents in. But because they were being pushed by the corning people and people like that yeah these are the culprits and you can see this one was actually painted over obviously it stopped working but they're just a little ceramic tube 
with a vent on the front and they're just placed in the wall. The positive things about napping tubes, there aren't any. The negatives, they don't fix rising damp and the, the damage they cause to a building in, during, through installation is just um, unacceptable. Electroosmosis, another one that got a big run in the early 70s. Uh, there are passive and non-passive systems. We did work in Venice, this is St. Helena Church, and two professors of the university, uh, the universities over there were the gurus on electroosmosis. And trying to dry this wall out, every time that started to work, they had three wires. They had one here, which was four volts, one here that was seven, and one here that was 14. When the wall started to dry out, the salts came to the surface and reversed the polarity. So instead of pushing damp down, it started to pull damp up. So they decided to crank up the power and they went seven, 14 and 28. They cooked all the salt in the wall. They drove out the hydrogen, created chlorine, the whole place stunk of chlorine. And we were left with a wall full of sodium hydroxide or caustic soda. So we had a hell of a time trying to pull all that salt out of that wall. When it works, it fails, basically. So it works sometimes. Gravity feed systems. You normally find that gravity feed are based on solvent systems. And they, they rely on the absorption into the brick by capillary. Unfortunately, a brick with rising damp is either full of water, 20 or 30% full of water. They have what we call blind pores and they have ear pores or voids, which are bigger than a capillary. So only part of your brick is saturated. And as they dry out, that then becomes porous again. So sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. High pressure chemical injection. There are companies around here putting this system in and they actually claim in their literature that you should plaster with a special plaster to take care of the damp where the damp course didn't work which is sort of telling you that it's not going to work well, which you do. These uh, packers are driven into the wall, they're mild steel packers. And this is a clutch system and they're put, put it in very high pressure. These rods are inserted in the wall and the high pressure is put there and left there for a length of time till it percolates through the wall. Your consumption of material I can't see this on the top here, but it's around about the uh, wrong way. Around about 30 odd liter, lit, liters per lineal meter. Low pressure injection. This is the one we've been promoting since 1974. Uh, this is a job in Venice. Um, we put a damp course in this uh, St. Apollonia, which is the old monastery for St. Mark's Basilica. We did it from a boat as well as from inside. This is your reason Venice is sinking. Look, they're all trampling on it. <laughs> because the bricks and the joints had all become one, the carbonation had taken through all the way through, we put the dam course in the joints. It was quite interesting to see that the, the lime and the brick had become homogenous and all one material. Although the drilling from the inside, we had material running down from the outside, we decided we'd go outside and come through the other way as well, just to make sure we got it. You won't believe that we did this in, I think it was in November, sorry, the, the September, in November, the tide, the high tide went one course above the where we put the dam course in. This is chemical injection being done. And you get visible confirmation of saturation. This is low pressure. The fluid is forced towards the back of the brick. It accumulates and then comes forward. So it actually saturates the back of the brick first and then spreads forward and sideways.
Some bricks inject fast, very fast. In fact, the more rising damp you have in a brick, the better they inject. It's actually telling you that uh, it's susceptible to moisture absorption and therefore inject injects much better. It's almost instant. You have complete visible confirmation that the wall has been injected. This is a project of double jail. There are about 2,000 million meters of nine inch walls. Oh, sorry, 18 inch walls, that's four bricks there. Turning the pressure off and on, you can actually minimize the waste. That's turned off. You turn it on, then it spreads again. And you can see how it just pushes it through. Injecting walls relies on two holes in each brick, or a header will have one hole, and they're drilled within 25 mil of the back of the brick. And we do what we call series drilling. So you drill it, you drill and inject the first one. You drill through the first one into the second one and ream the first one out with a 12 millimeter drill and so on. On an 18 inch wall, this thing you do it from both sides. But your consumption is about 12 liters per linear meter. So it's about 30% of what the high pressure takes. The requirements of injection fluids have taken a long time to establish the, uh, the correct material. We have a material that has no flash point. It's uh, combustible. They gel within 24 to 48 hours. So they actually stay where you put them in. You have the a much lower density of the water. This uh, one liter of this material weighs about 700 grams. And you can actually inject a damp substrate. They have a cyanine content which actually goes looking for moisture, it's a moisture scavenger. If you do have a problem, you can over-inject over it, although it's very unusual, and they're very stable. I did, uh, I introduced this into Australia in 1974, and we haven't uh, had a breakdown yet. What you don't want is a th water, a material thicker than water, or the same as water, because they will repel each other. Highly flammable is too dangerous. And there are cases of people blowing houses up. A long cure time, which relies on drying or alkalinity. When you have rising damp, normally your pH of your brickwork at the base of the wall is pH neutral, seven. And your alkalinity doesn't occur, occur till you get to the height where the damp peaks because the act of damp has carried the alkalinity up the wall. And a damp cause 600 mil up the wall is no good at all. Water-based materials are repellent to themselves and they can sometimes, if you use silicates, they can be detrimental to the building. This is where we come about the salt problems. Every damp problem you have from rising damp has a salt contamination. The extent is normally based on the age of the building, but sometimes in a, uh, we, we get added salts into the ground, like in Wollongong areas, common to have sulfates in the soil and chlorides because they use fuel from VHP. So this is what causes your real contamination. This is a job in Venice again. We poulticed this wall over a two year period. And we have happened that we actually pulled out nine kilo of salt out of each square meter of wall. They're very thick walls but the bricks were 30% by weight salt. We actually took these two bricks out of the wall and we brought them back to Australia and we did various testing on it. This is in May, 2008. We put the damp course in. You can see the wall where the rising damp is active. In December, 2008, it's starting to dry out. In September, 2009, the wall's completely dry. This is the pulses on the wall. But the amazing thing is that come out of the wall and that was growing on the face of the pulses. The salt that's growing becomes more porous and draws more and more salt. We were actually taking out, like I said, nine kilo and we could write in the salt that was so thick on the surface of the pulses. And the pulses was 68% by weight salt and the 32% by weight pulses. 
We did a lot of work in Venice. Uh, this is the university in Venice where they actually teach restoration. These are the new miracle renders they're pushing in Europe. Um, there are three layer render, which have a waterproof coating, uh, an evaporative coating and a, a finish on the top. Unfortunately, they slow down the evaporation and they force water to go higher. The university here, this is the original Cocchio Pesto plastering and it's actually pushed up into the vaulted ceilings right throughout the whole university. So that, uh, that render has caused more problems than it's fixed. The types of salts and their origin, we always find chloride, nitrate and sulfates. They are the anion, the damaging salts or your acidic salts. But if you know what the cation are, you can get an idea of where they've come from. So if you've got calcium, you can have calcium chloride, calcium nitrate, calcium sulfate. We know calcium chloride is from uh, sea salt. We know calcium nitrate is from rotting vegetation and calcium sulfate, gypsum. Uh, so take sodium, we have sodium chloride, sea salt again, sodium nitrate from sewerage, sodium sulfate, normally used to do glass. And it's very unusual to find sodium sulfate in your rising damp jobs, although that does happen. And they are the worst salt. Salt contamination, we normally do drill tests to establish a removal. And you can see the cocoon again with the uh, salt growing on the surface. This is a vaulted ceiling and you can see some movement here. That's a 13th century Quedlinburg castle and that's at the bottom of this thing. Oldest house in Germany. Uh, uh, this is the glass museum in Quedlinburg. This is the oldest house, 1354. The glass museum is part of that uh, uh, site, if you like. Um, we put the uh, damp courses in here and poultice the salt out. You can see your, your main drying out area where your salt occurs. Your main dry, wetting and drying area. And that is the oldest half dimmed house in Germany. The source of different salts, obviously, in the sea, this is Fort Denison. This is where we actually developed the poultice, um, working with the CSIRO. Built in stone from the actual site, as well as uh, brought in from other places, but the Mortello Tower, all eating away the salt. This is the northern wall that was replaced in 1994. They used the wrong stone. They used cement in the joints, and unfortunately in 2004, this was the state of it. Using hard cement joints in stone or brickwork, if you have a salt contamination, because of the lower evaporation rates of your mortar, you actually push your salt into your stone uh, or your bricks, and they become sacrificial. This is very common to see this around Sydney. Inside, uh, stone walls were all poulticed. Uh, the floors are all out. The tide comes in every day, twice a day. Some of this wall here is actually bedrock. So it's quite, uh, quite a challenge to get the salts out of it. Miracle Square in Pisa in Italy. Um, another job that we worked on this site on the Duomo. This end of the Duomo, the right side, is about 10 metres from a cemetery. Nitrates from the cemetery and actually percolate across into the main apse area on that side. And these, this marble panelling was all eating away with nitrate. We applied the pulpus and we took out an enormous amount of that salt and uh, with two applications. St. Matthew's Church window, uh, another nitrates problem where we were talking sodium nitrates, which is sewage. They actually put the, uh, the graves very, very close to the building. And unfortunately the decaying bodies, the salts from the decaying bodies are eating the church away. This is on the north facing wall. So when it rains, the water goes down here, it's sucked up by the church and evaporates out. So this side was much worse than the southern side. Suffolk House, Penang, Malaysia. This is 1793 Suffolk House, um, built by, Colonel Francis Light, for those of you who know Adelaide, his son 
laid out the streets of Adelaide. You can see the original columns. It been left to go to ruin, basically. But a beautiful old building in its day. Um, shoring up was necessary because everything was going haywire, moving out, moving up, moving sideways everywhere. But full of rising damp, full of falling damp, full of everything. We tried to save as much of the original plaster as we could. Unfortunately, the fibrous plaster had all gone and uh, the bats had got into the ceiling. So that sort of was the end of that. But um, chemical damp caused pulsing and we used a, a lime water to consolidate the plaster work. All of these stones that were lifted were all numbered and relayed when they put them back. Turned out to be a very, very nice building. I've been back there since. It's a nice restaurant there. And uh, I saw a, um, a series on television called the Indian Summer. And they actually featured it as a summer house for the people in that uh, series. These are some of the cornices that were rerun. And there's the finished building. So it's a very, very nice job. Low pressure injection has proved to be the most reliable. Um, you have visible confirmation. Um, it, sometimes we don't actually put a damp course in. We will just take the salt out. Elizabeth Farm, we just removed the salt because we thought changing the original fabric of the oldest house in Australia was not really warranted. So we actually left the the uh, damp course or the active rising damp. If you take the salt out and it's taken a hundred years to get that bad, if you remove that salt, in theory, it should take a hundred years to come back that bad, but you wouldn't let it get that bad. So it, there is a, a reason why you don't want to put a damp course in, in some cases, especially if it's uh, a house that's got to be lived in, um, you need to take care of it. If you don't remove the salt, you must take care of your salt. Uh, the, you can make provision for it by using salt retarding renders if the, if the house has no heritage value. Sacrificial renders, uh, they, they save the original fabric, but they don't last that long. So the high maintenance is sometimes not acceptable. Well, that's all I've got. I've gone a little bit quicker than I was going to because I didn't want Nate Arby and held up. <laughs> so. I'll say thank you. Thanks, Barry. Um, we haven't got any questions from the floor specifically yet. Um, but yep, there's there's a, a link for more info um, direct from Westox. So you can see there that there's a depth of practical application of specific techniques to this sort of problem. So reach out if you need the help. Um, just before I introduce Nader again, um, no doubt most of you would have been aware that increase in activity that ACRA have had for expanding our membership into the wider remedial industry. Um, and we do welcome suggestions on um, webinars such as this, which aren't our historically traditional concrete repair type project. Um, so yeah, place those into either the chat or reach out to Nicole at the Secretariat whenever you come up with an idea. Um, we are open to suggestions. Okay, just having a look. Um, yeah, Barry, that, that was pretty damn good. And some of those photos uh, really illustrated the problem, particularly with the poultice work you were doing on the okay. places over in, um, in that ship shape village. A very nice illustration of how the um, the salts come through the surface. So thanks for that. Um, if any other questions do come up, again put them in the Q and A uh, session, and we can do another chat at the end of the, the webinar. Um, oh, here we go. There are a couple that have come in. One is from Tuhidal Alam. I hope I've pronounced that right, Tuhidal. What kind of material is used to fill the drilled holes once the chemical injection is done? If they're not behind the skirting, which they normally are, you can use a coloured mortar to match the stone. And if it's done good, done properly, you can actually 
emergency situation where you have to get down on your knees to see the holes. So they can be colour matched with the mortar. Okay, that's if it's going to be a visible finish and no render over the top. Sure. Yep. Okay, uh, second question there from Christelle Main. Uh, how do salts affect waterproof renders? The salts can affect waterproof renders by accumulating. If you get any drying out, uh, you're going to have a big issue that will push the render off. Salts are stable in two forms, when they're wet and when they're dry. A waterproof render usually aims to keep the wall wet and the inside of the building dry. So if that wall is maintained moist, the salts can't dry, they can't crystallize, and they should be reasonably stable. If you fix a damp problem and you put a waterproof render above your damp course, you're gonna have big problems because as that wall dries, the salts crystallize and they've been measured at 300 MPA. There's a paper put out by a Winkler uh, in the American Bulletin uh, where they tested the expansion forces and they were up to 300 MPA. So to try and lock salts in with a waterproof render as the wall dries is impossible. Yeah, those tiny, tiny crystals can exert a hell of a lot of pressure. <laughs> 25 <laughs> PSI. 300. Oh, sorry, no, the salt, yeah. No, I'm yep. saying we inject it about 25 PSI. Oh, okay, no worries. Here's another question from Rob Davies. Um, do damp rods work as good as injections? <sighs> damp rods are one of these silane, water-based silane materials. We tried them out in 2000. We did a couple of jobs on uh, Parramatta Town Hall and another one on um, the Hambledon Cottage. And we ended up taking some bricks out and testing them. And the, the penetration was minimal. So we actually re-injected that with a chemical, the solvent-based one. Mm. It's one of those systems where they use a pre-measured amount. And if you don't get full saturation, it's not going to be re-injected. You can do it with a solvent-based system, but you can't reintroduce the rods. And it's really no different to the other systems that have been used where they had frozen silane ice cubes where they put them in the wall and let them thaw out. I mean, there's lots of these type of ideas, but the one we've found the most efficient with visible confirmation is the low pressure ejection. Thank you. Um, Justin Sonny's has got I hate a... Block walls. <laughs> Sorry, what was that? I hate block walls. <laughs> <laughs> um, They're a new thing. <laughs> um, yeah. Rising down in a in a block wall, you normally find it doesn't go very high, two or three inches at the most. Uh, sorry, but I talk the old language. So 75 mil at the most. You could use a silane material in a block wall. Some of the silanes, they're based on a, a silane which is, relies on alkalinity to cure. They work very well on concrete and they work very well on concrete blocks, but they don't work very well on brick. So you might be able to do something with a, a silane. Okay, thank you. Um, Mike Rutherford from our Queensland um, branch, and he's also on the board. Thanks, Mike, for this question. Um, the case histories that you've got on there, most of them were for Fort Dennis, well, sorry, most were North, Northern Hem Hemisphere. Um, how extensive are the case examples in Australia and what length of time have they been treated for? I'll do you another one with all, another presentation with all Australian buildings, if you wish. Okay. Or I can do you all uh, Malaysian buildings. <laughs> yeah. Um, Malaysia is a huge problem in that area. They have uh, very high chloride and sulfate and Penang in Malaysia in particular. Uh, the water table is about one metre below the ground. Right. So, so that means all the, all the nasties. And we've just finished a couple of nice jobs in Sarawak, in uh, Kuching, in East Malaysia. Okay. Which are, uh, the old museum in Sarawak, the old uh, Sarawak Museum, and St. Joseph's uh, um, Missionary School in Kuching. So, yeah, we've done some very nice jobs over there. Okay. Well, we, we might call on you for some more Australian examples. For, yeah, absolutely. Uh, for, for a future webinar. I think the Petra ones and the baptism site are the more interesting ones. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get references harder than the baptism site, Graham. They come from facts number one. <laughs> <laughs>
Nice. Um, okay, Nathan Davies has a question about a standard brick veneer home built in the 70s with only one layer of brick and no DPC installed. Would chasing out a course of mortar bed and installing a PVC damp proof course be a common application? Sorry, I didn't understand that. Oh, it's essentially, it's a standard Aussie brick veneer home built in the 70s with one, one skin of brick and no DPC installed. Extruded uh, bricks? Sorry? Did they say oh, they were extruded? Not specifically. I guess no, he's it just... It doesn't matter. You can still inject an extruded brick, but yep. you have to be aware you're going to use a bit more material because they're full of holes. Yep. Um, and if you they haven't been laid very well and you've got mortar joints missing, you could get it all over your head from above. Mm. So you turn your pressure right down and you let it just seep through. If you cut a dam course in, they work the conventional type dam course is the only other system I would recommend. But you've got to be aware you could get settlement. Yes. You could get cracking in your walls through settlement because to get it in the, the mortar in with the same compressive strength as it was when you took it out is very difficult. Yeah. Um, and I guess, pardon me, <clears throat> that's one of those things with the injection systems. If the building continues to move, then you can come back and deal okay. with that. Yeah, you can redo it, but you have no capillary there. Yep. Okay. Senator, he's going to regale us with the latest in the Helifix armory for repairing um, masonry deficiencies in clay, concrete, and stone. Over to you, Nader. Thanks, Graham. I'll just share my screen here. Okay, um, look, uh, thanks guys. So as Graham's mentioned, I'm Nader. I'm the business unit manager for Helifix, um, rebranded under the banner of Levia. Um, so they've given me 30 minutes. So I'll try to use it as much as I can. This is usually an hour presentation, but again, I have culled quite a fair bit from it just to try and highlight the important things at least. So typically the, the way I like to undertake the presentation is just to go through types of defects that are quite common or some uncommon, but um, just to give us an idea of um, what causes cracking. And then we can move into, you know, traditional repairs or, you know, a Helfix style um, repair solution. So if you can see, I've, I've put a quite an extensive list of types of um, defects or things that cause cracking. And they're both split up into, you know, um, below ground or foundation movements, as well as superstructure or above ground um, causes or movements. Now, I won't go through every single one of them, but we'll go through a couple of the important ones here. Now, this is probably the one we are all most familiar with, um, especially, you know, where we're riddled with clay um, soils, at least around, you know, um, Sydney, Melbourne sort of area. Now, over here, you can see it's a typical brick arch. Um, you've got um, uh, some cracking along here. Um, typically, any foundation movement causes stepped cracking. Um, and what's sort of special about this particular photo is that this was the original crack along here. Now, what, what's actually happened is the buildings continue to move and uh, it's actually caused another set of cracking here, which is caused um, secondary cracking because what's happened is the loads from the roof or whatever on this um, wall cannot continue and go further down here as, you know, there's been a separation along here. And so this section has been overloaded and caused another set of cracking. Uh, just over here on the second image shows a nice sort of stepped crack. Um, again, typical of some sort of ground movement. Um, in this case, it was some foundation movements. Um, one telltale sign, um, the beauty of, you know, seeing these sort of cracks is it can tell you quite a lot of what the cause of the problem is. And so step cracking always um, indicates that there's some sort of movement really some ground movement and the direction out over here that you can see if you draw a perpendicular line um, to that crack it points to where the main movement is occurring and what's happening is 
this front portion here of this um, freestanding garage has dropped over here. And this whole section of brickwork has sort of rotated and starting to come down this way. That's why you've got a smaller or thinner crack down at the bottom as, and it progressively gets larger up at the top here. And again, typical of um, uh, foundation movement, in this case, some clay shrinkage. Um, another type of um, cracking, again, it's the same sort of stepped or diagonal cracking that you can see, but trees can be quite a, a big cause of that um, sort of foundation movements where they can, and this is just a diagram where it shows you that the tree can reduce the water table um, locally along here. Now, again, what that um, causes is the soils or clays to shrink or you know, consolidate in you know, a localized area. Again, causing this foundation to drop even further. And again, causing this stepped cracking you, you can see over here in this diagram. Uh, settlement sometimes gets wrongly, um, I guess, classed as um, the same as shrinkage. Uh, one, one thing we can pretty much have them as uh, a separate uh, sort of mechanism is that settlement's usually just done in the first, you know, few months, years, depending on the type of development. Um, but it's once you know your slab or footings have been laid, um, if there hasn't been adequate time to let it um, consolidate, or you know there hasn't been uh, proper compaction um, within the footings or the, the slab on ground, whatever it may be, um, it can cause the building again or the foundations to drop and give you the same issues or the same cracking patterns as um, clay shrinkage. Now, um, it's the same sort of deal. Shallow footings, you've got, um, this is an example, a diagrammatic example, of course, of an extension um, where you've got a, 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 an addition to your um, existing dwelling. Now, what's, what can occur is you've got um, some different depths of your footings. Now, this can cause a problem, especially if, you know, the existing building has already um, you know, settled and consolidated, and then you've got your um, a new development here with shallower footings. And again, that whenever a building, I'm sure we're all aware, buildings are always moving. And so your weakest points are typically around openings, um, such as doors or windows, and you'll get cracking along those. They're the first um, points to really um, uh, show signs of uh, movement or, or cracking. And like all the other sort of foundation problems or issues, you've got some sort of stepped cracking um, along here, um, as you can see. Again, I, I believe this will be the last one I'm going to talk about about foundation problems, so bear with me. Um, uh, erosion and soil softening. This is highly, um, I guess, uh, applicable to old style apartments that I've seen, at least um, the typical style for you, or those of you uh, around Sydney, um, Marrickville Way, those typical two, three story um, apartment blocks that have, um, uh, that are typically falling to the rear in terms of the site drainage. What I've seen in the past or is their downpipes, whenever they don't have any gravity drainage to the streets, um, back in the day, uh, I don't think you can get away with it now, but what they do is they have these downpipes just discharge straight into the um, ground and let it sort of dissipate in there as a, a makeshift absorption system. Now, unfortunately, again, we that's not a very good um, idea, having water close to your foundations or moving um, water to the foundations. And what can happen is you know, it starts to erode or remove the soils around the footings and these footings begin dropping. Um, and again, as you can see, giving you the exact same style of cracking as it would of, you know, with clay shrinkage or, or even settlement. So uh, the reason why I sort of bring all these up before getting into, you know, repairs and whatnot, it's the, the types of cracking and um, can give you a wealth of information on how or what the cause 
is and the best repair methods, really. Um, so the, the, with Helifix, um, at least we always try to give a, 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 a solution, really. Um, it, it could be one thing just putting in bars um, to say, yep, uh, you just put in um, heli bars to re strengthen that up. But the issue may be that if you've got this sort of problem here, that issue is ongoing. And so if the building is going to drop even further, yes, you've strengthened up this section here now. You, you know, it, it won't continue cracking whatsoever, but as um, building and you know the stresses within a building work, um, you get a more of a drop, it's going to find the next weakest point and alleviate its stress there and cause cracking. So you might be introducing cracking you know, further into the building where there wasn't any cracking. So um, really important just really to understand um, the causes um, and what's you know, the best repair method there. So don't mind this wording here. Uh, I'm going to breeze through it, but just to give you an idea, we're onto the superstructure or you know, movement above the ground. And so thermal and moisture content um, within Brickworks. Um, I've got some little numbers pretty much here where we're just stating that um, a, a typical thermal expansion rate of 0 0.008 millimetres per metre per degree um, in Celsius. Um, all that really translate in that is that if you've got a 10 metre long run um, of a brick wall without any sort of expansion joints and whatnot, or even if you had expansion joints, that wall will move 3.2 meters in a uh, millimeters, apologies, in a um, change of temperature of about 40 degrees. So that could be, you know, winter from winter to summer. Um, you could, you know, possibly experience, and at least in Australia, in some parts, experience that change of temperature um, throughout the year of 40 degrees. Now, 3.2 millimeters isn't that much, in all honesty. Um, so. However, Australian standards does call up for, um, you know, expansion joints or articulation joints every six metres um, within a, a, a building. Now, what's bigger cause of this um, type of superstructure cracking would be brick growth. Now, sometimes they, they are wrongly used interchangeably. Now, the difference between the two is um, brick growth isn't cyclical. So as most of you would be aware, bricks come out of the kiln pretty much bone dry. Now, uh, given the current industry, uh, it's hard for everyone to wait for the bricks to climatize. And, you know, they're supposed to be kept out um, in the weather to absorb um, water just so they can, you know, essentially grow. And um, what happens is these, it's actually a chemical reaction within the brickwork. It's not just absorbing and then evaporating the um, moisture as per you know thermal and moisture movements. This is a, a purely a chemical reaction that occurs within the brickwork and the water, which permanently expands these bricks. Now, again, I've given a bit of a, a number here. So if you've got a highly expansive brick, um, what, what can happen is over a 10 meter long run, um, this can grow 24 millimeters, which is a much more than you know thermal moisture movements. Now the difference between again, like I mentioned, this and the moisture movement, this is a permanent movement. And what happens, I've got some photos here, is over time it will give you a dead straight crack pretty much or near straight as you can see on this first picture here. But on this one, very, very typical of brick growth. Um, so what's happened is over time, it, say again, first 10, 15 years, these bricks continued to grow till they had nowhere really to move. And one of the, one side had to give way. So in this case, it was on this side. It could have easily cracked along this side instead of that side. And so purely um, what I find is a lot of engineers tend to spec, you know, um, uh, recreating um, this articulation joint here. Um, again, it, it depends on the building, but with it being brick growth, that's not going to grow much more, depending on, again, how old that building is. So pretty much brick growth occurs, 90% of it occurs within the first 15 years of its lifetime. And then the remaining, you know, 10% or so occurs over the, the next 100 years or, and whatnot. So um, knowing the age of the building is quite important, just to give us an idea of what repair method you'd really want to 
undertake here. So typically what we would um, suggest to the engineers would be pretty much just to um, stitch with our heli bars across the corners, so bent them on the external skin um, every four courses or so. Um, and then if the engineer wants to introduce articulation joints, they can do, um, you know, elsewhere in a better position than at a corner. Um, so corners, you really want it to be quite strong, um, pretty much. So again, reinstating that structural integrity with the heli bars would be ideal in this situation. Um, now, I, I hate calling these traditional repair methods, but um, it, it sort of stuck with me and I'm, I'm a habitual creature. So uh, rebuilding, it's not really a repair here, but again, sometimes a, a building um, may be deemed too far gone, um, you know, whether it's bowed out too much, you know, say, you know, uh, additional stories put on top and they haven't keyed in any um, or have any lateral support um, with the external brickwork and the you know floor joists and whatnot sometimes it, the engineers called up it has to be repaired or rebuilt and so that can be quite costly um de definitely costly compared to um traditional repair methods but again that, that's sometimes unavoidable um so that's one thing that can be done um, I, I, I don't think it's very fair for me to call this traditional. Um, it's actually quite unique. I, I haven't seen something like this, at least in Australia. Th this was over in the UK. Um, one of my colleagues took a photo of, and this is providing some, some lateral support. It always gets me laughing, but um, lateral support for this building here. Um, they've used brick columns uh, or uh, to shore up the, the, the building here. Um, Again, you've always just wonder if they even own this side of the land or is it council owned? Um, again, it, not fair to call it traditional, but again, nonetheless, it is a type of um, a repair method for this. Um, uh, obviously, Helifix um, would have some better repair methods. Um, e even anyone else should come up with something a bit better than this, but um, rest assured, uh, I, I don't think I've seen this in real life, thankfully, but uh, it's, it's out there. <laughs> Um, here we've got patches plates. Now, again, I've grown up calling these patches plates. People call these anchors. Some others have different words for it, but essentially these are high strength anchors, really. They're, they're actually perfect. They, they work quite well with concrete and whatnot. But what, again, engineers, even sometimes builders forget is that brickwork does not behave the same as concrete at all. Um, it, it's quite imperative to understand that the bricks are individual units and held together by sometimes a very, very poor mortar, um, especially in these older buildings. And what's occurring here is you've got a high load or high point load, um, keeping, so it's a sort of a diaphragm anchor, um, keeping the um, walls from say the northern end and the southern end together um, without um, parting ways. And so what's actually happening in this one is it's, pooling out this whole section of brickwork. And with brick, because they're individual units um, held together with, you know, generally weak mortar, these would need to be dissipate or spread out the load. So, you know, ties to hold it into the internal structure would be a much more effective solution. Now, I'll go into our Helifix repair methods over here. Um, this is probably, um, a rundown of our, our main products that we, we supply and provide um, solutions for repairs. So here you can see a, a half installed heli bar, which is used to stitch or um, brickwork. So when we call it stitch, it's not going to pull the cracks any closer. It's going to keep them locked to that length of or the width of that crack and provide that structural integrity. So one other thing, again, to remember, whenever you've got any cracking within brickwork, you, you've essentially created, a, 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 I guess, two separate walls. Loads aren't going to be transferring between that crack anymore. And so putting in these bars are what are pretty much reinstating that structural integrity um, of that wall. So making it back as one piece. This is our dry fix ties. Now, these are remedial ties. They have been used in new build. Um, so, some, some projects that um, re require, couldn't use, you know, thin wire ties or whatever the case may be, have used tie fix as well. Um, the beauty of these, it can be used in 
any type of brickwork. But again, one thing to bear in mind is they are heavily reliant, like all retrofitted tyres are quite reliant on the substrate. So um, if you've got a weak brick, it's not going to hold as well as if it was a harder brick. So these um, uh, can use a chemical version or a resi tie style, and I'll go through those as well. Um, but th these two are probably the bread and butter of Helifix. Whenever anyone thinks of Helifix, they'll think either stitching or remedial ties. This is a lesser known product. Um, now, this is the at the um, uh, underside of a, um, a double story building where you've got some floor joists running along um, the, the base. Now, typically, I think it's prior to the 60s or so, there wasn't any real standard of having the external brickwork tied into the um, floor joists. Um, so with having the lack of lateral support and causing bulging within a, um, a, the, the building. And so these Bowtie HDs, they're like um, essentially a, um, a, a th almost threaded rod um, with a sacrificial drill bit at the end. So they're, they're injected uh, or screwed into the floor joists and injected into the brickwork to provide that you know, mechanical key between the external brickwork and the, um, the floor joists themselves. So I'll just go into a bit more depth about these dry fix ties. Um, as mentioned, they, they're heavily reliant on the substrate they're being driven into. Um, now, typically you'd dr be drilling a five millimeter pilot hole through both substrates. So it could be brick to concrete, brick to timber, you know, timber to brick. It, it really doesn't matter which way you come. You can come from the timber side into the brickwork or the brick to the timber. Again, really, really no issues here. Um, but the five mil clearance or pilot hole is done, um, you know, through, let's say we're going through the bricks face here. So leaving about 70 mil or requiring a 70 mil embedment into the internal skin. And then as being demonstrated here, you've got the power driver, which sets the drill to hammer only, and then it drives the tie in. So it just taps the tie in periodically, and then it creates its own thread and cuts its fins into the brick. So the ties themselves, they're eight millimeter in diameter. So with the five mil pilot hole, you're giving yourself about three millimeters of bite within the brickwork. And it, it, it's always imperative to have these, um, have ties tested because of the nature of brickwork. So uh, you'd be hard pressed to find that uh, bricks will be the exact same, even in the same batch um, in terms of um, strength wise. So uh, we do always stress testing is quite key um, for um, a dry fix sort of situation. Um, crack stitching, like mentioned previously, this is our you know bread and butter. Um, again, if you haven't heard of them, all it really is, it's a six millimeter um, helical um, cold form stainless steel rod, really. Uh, and the, the helical profile is pretty much there just so it can bond with the applicated heli bond. And the, the reason why this works, you know, I'd say better than a, a stainless steel or just a, a round bar of equal diameter of a six mil diameter is that the helical profile allows the heli bond to bond quite well with the bar itself. So typical um, application, you only need to um, grind out a 25 mil deep chase within the um, mortar joints and you inject about a 10 millimeter um, bead of heli bond into the back of that chase, push the bar in as shown here, and then um, once you're done, you'd put another 10 millimeter bead um, of heli bond in front. Um, now, the beauty of, again, these products are it can be completely concealed. So once it's all installed and cured, you're able to repoint that with a, you know, a matching mortar. Um, to, that, that's why a lot of heritage architects slash engineers do swear by this sort of um, repair method because it is quite non-invasive. Um, so you don't have to go through the brickwork, it can be installed within the mortar there. Um, this again, with heli bar reinforcement, it's the same as our heli bars themselves, but you can end up creating a masonry style beam. Now we don't, 
whenever anyone thinks of beams, it's obviously the timber beams, reinforced concrete or steel beams, never masonry, because masonry is, you know, you're hard pressed to find being able to hold itself up over, you know, a one meter opening if it's not arched at all. And so that's what heli bars can do. They can create a masonry beam over the top. Now, a few of the installers, they do like um, using these heli beams. So that means just putting two bars in, let's say, course just above the um, opening, and then you'll go another four courses up and put another two bars. Now that does need to span 500 millimeters past the opening on both sides um, to create a, a proper beam. Now, what, what that makes is if it dissipates the load. So let's say you've got your loads coming down over the opening. Once it gets onto the beam that you've created, it will then transfer the load and then down away from the opening. A lot of um, installers like using this, like I mentioned, um, it's in preference when they're re removing lintels. Um, so instead of scaffolding or propping, sorry, they'll, they'll utilize these heli beams um, to either have a lighter or a another defense against the propping itself. So that's something you can utilize with the same heli bars. Again, these are still the six mil heli bars. They can come in seven meter lengths, um, same price per meter anyway. So um, that, that's something to bear in mind as well. Um, th this is just a closer photo of the Bowtie HD that I was talking about previously, where you, you drill, um, have a 15 or 16 mil clearance hole through the um, brickwork, put the Bowtie HD, um, I know you, probably can't see it very well in this photo, but um, you've got a sharp sacrificial drill bit or tip at the end of these bow ties, which allow it to cut or drill through the um, timber. And due to its thread that we've um, put on it, it pulls itself through and then um, bites into both um, uh, joists there and creating a key between the brickwork and the floor joists. Patch pen's not a very well-known product, but um, it, it, again, it's similar to our dry fix ties. It's just used to, um, you know, add concrete onto spalled concrete. Um, so whenever you've got any um, spalled concrete, really, patch pins get driven within the concrete, pre providing a mechanical key between the old concrete and the new that's being poured and, you know, formed up um, if it's overhead. Gets a little tricky, but uh, it, it's something to, to think about if you've, you're on a site and then find any sort of spalled concrete um, instead of cutting out and redoing. It is quite a quick, um, easy way to do it. Now, I do have a small video. Um, it, th this was just some in-house testing that we've done. Nothing formal whatsoever. As you can see, it was in our old warehouse over in Alexandria. Um, we built a 2.4 meter wide um, uh, a beam, if you could call it that. So. We're just demonstrating that sort of beam um, properties you can get by putting heli bars in. So as mentioned, we did put more than what you normally would. We put in three bars in this top course and three bars in this bottom course. And obviously no lintel or anything at the bottom. So we'll just, you know, trying to see what we can get away with um, with our own eyes instead of testing that we've done over in the universities. It's something to, that everyone might be able to relate to in this video instead of, you know, numbers on paper, pretty much. And so we've got some fast workers just loading up these bricks um, on top of the beam itself. So right now, um, as shown there, we loaded at 350 kilonewton, uh, kilograms, and um, we're still not having any signs of, you know, deflection within this. So we've gone and loaded up a, um, a pallet of Helibond um, to see if we can get this thing moving. Now, as mentioned, so it's a 530 kilo pallet, um, obviously not the safest method um, to load up uh, this thin beam, but again, uh, we're a little desperate um, to try and get this moving. So you might not have been able to see there, but this did um, bend down a little and then spring back up. So that's again, another property for these um, heli bars. It create, gives ductility. And ductility um, for structural engineers out there is the main thing that you want to see. You don't want sudden failure. So that ductility allows you to um, visually see some failure. So again, we're putting a, about a ton um, onto this beam here. Um, you, what, what's happened is, so you've got some deflection of about 10 mil at the mid span. 
And again, it's sprung back up, but it has caused some cracking. You wouldn't be able to say it, but it has cracked in the middle along here. But um, again, it springs back up and as mentioned, is only leaving a five mil deflection. So it's gone past its plastic deformation on that um, the beam. So this would technically be deemed as a failure right now. So from the time, but it's not a, a, a catastrophic failure. Um, we've decided to go one more step and load it on its side, so out of plane. Now, again, bricks without the heli bars or the heli bond would not be standing as they are right now. Um, that, that would have collapsed on it by its own self weight. And so we've gone and um, tried to load it up with um, the bricks as well, just to see what we can do. And the string line's a bit more visible now in this, this yellow string line you can see. So as they continue to load up the brickwork, you, you get to see the bricks just dipped past that yellow spr um, string line. And as they go, you start to see it, you know, bow, obviously exaggerated like this, but it starts to bow mid-span and um, 230 kilos giving us 12 mil deflection there um, past that string line. And video should be done soon. I'll fast forward a little. So we unloaded it and this was the last test here. We decided to put a, you can see how it's already bowed this, um, this beam here and last, Test was to put the heli bonds on top and step back. You can you see it bowed quite a fair bit here and without completely deforming. Well, it's deformed, but um, not not complete failure. Um, but that brings up my presentation to an end. Um, just one thing to always bear in mind is um, always understanding what causes the cracks, gives us a wealth of information on how, you know, you can repair uh, and uh, provide a, a solution for. But again, if, if any questions, I'm more than happy to take. Excellent. Thanks, Nader. Um, Mike's got a couple of questions there in the, in the question box. One about the load rating of remedial tyres. Um, yeah, yeah I'll that there. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so with the load ratings, um, again, it's going to be heavily dependent on the um, substrate, like mentioned. And so the way you test it, we've got to test load test units. So we can come out onto site, um, we can hire out the load test units as well. It's essentially just like a, a key that screws over the tie that would be sticking out of the brickwork. You'd latch that on and you crank it up and it will give you a load reading. So we typically try aim for a, um, uh, a one kilonewton loading to sort of justify uh, a, a 600 spacings according to the standards. Um, it, we do have um, test data as well. Like, but again, because with remedial work, you're heavily reliant on the bricks you're doing. So it's not a one solution fits all sort of thing. So. Um, that, that's something we can do pop on site as well to uh, do feasibility and see if, you know, the ties, well, what spacings are going to end up being required from whatever load you're, you're achieving. Okay. Are you testing every tie or one in 10? What's the sample rate? Oh, okay. So it depends on the um, square meterage you're after. So we typically go for, on, on large jobs, you'd want to go for a 5% test rating um, of the number of ties that you're going for. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, what about wire cut bricks? Can you use remedial ties on those as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm assuming they're the, another word for the extruded brickworks. Um, now, you definitely can. We do find that the extruded or wire cut bricks, they're a lot harder than standard dry press clay bricks. Um, so it, it, it can go to a case where, um, especially over in Melbourne, for some reason, they, the bricks are just so much harder than ours up here in Sydney. Um, they do go for a six millimeter, um, uh, like a six millimeter uh, pilot hole in comparison to the five mil that we usually spec. But I would always suggest go five mil first. Now the embedment, obviously, if you're going through the extrusions themselves, it's not going to um, uh, obviously bond to the full one ten of the brick. It's you're going to have, you know, call it maybe 40, 50 mils worth of only um, bonding. But um, due to the hardness of those extrude brickworks, that's not an issue. Um, again, depending on obviously all wire cut bricks and extrude bricks, 
Dropbox Playbrix are all different. So you want to have a um, testing done just for you know feasibility purposes as well, but it definitely can be done on those. Okay. Um, another question here about it's about the durability and, and the finished appearance. Um, yeah. It is all stainless steel material, but are there any right. conditions yeah. where you wouldn't? Yeah, yeah. 316 marine yep. grade, so there really isn't any issues whatsoever when it comes to it. So um, the UK do provide a 304, but uh, over here in Australia, we only bring in the 316 just to save muck-ups, you know. Yeah, um, Sing any, single product line, yeah. nice and easy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Are there any yeah. situations where you wouldn't use it, like down right near the, near the title mark on oh. it? <laughs> Well, in, in all honesty, it, it, it comes to, so we, we've, we've used them on, on sea walls and the, the lights. So again, there's no, no spot you can't really use it. Yeah. And it's really, what else have we got? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, what, what about the finished detail? Uh, are they always plugged? Um, when so, you're doing so, um, it was, um, Pretty much what you can do is, let, let's say we're doing the dry fix ties. So you've gone through the brickwork. Um, so you, you, you'll have those five millimeter pilot holes um, visible there pretty much. And so what would happen is um, what installers in the past have done is they've mixed up mortar with some, and because obviously it's hard to get color match in your brick. Sometimes what they do is they use the brick dust from the drilled bits and mix that in with the mortar to um, have it as a patch up um, there. That's usually the best you can get away with. But again, you're not going to see those five mil pilot holes um, unless you've put them in yourself, if you know what I mean. Yeah, it blends. Um, I might get you to stop sharing your screen if you can. Yeah, sure. um, we've also got a question from Dan Corbett up there at Fairview Solutions. Hello, Dan. Um, bonding a soft brick to concrete. There's a few soft bricks around. Um, yeah. Would you resin set the brick face to the tie if you had to go to a greater diameter hole? That, correct, yeah. So when you're going from a softer um, material into a harder material, it's always going to be uh, either a, um, a resin on, or it has to be resin the whole way. But the beauty of the resin, again, you can actually go through the mortar joints. Yeah. The, so you'll go through the mortar joint of the brickwork so you're not left with an unsightly hole in the brick itself. Um, so resin both sort of applications, or if it works dry fixed into the brickwork, again, um, you can do that and then resin over the clearance hole that you've got in the um, brickwork itself. Yep, nice and easy. All right, well, just mindful of the time, if there's any further questions, please send them through to Nicole and we, we can distribute them to the panelists. Um, in the meantime, in absentia, I'll thank Barry for his time and Nader again for putting in the time today. Um, we do look forward to more of this industry, uh, remedial industry webinars coming through. So like I said earlier, please make your suggestions known. If there's areas of deficiency that you see in the industry that we can cover as the preeminent remedial association in Australasia, then let's do it. Um, because nobody does it like ACRA does it. 